My intention for now is to look again at pretty much what we looked at previously, but now for one specific language, ALC, ups on other language with complements. And this time I'm really going to introduce things one by one uh, again and look at examples again and do the semantics and everything. Right? So, you know, again, you know, if you now look at it and have a question, you ask me the question. But then we move on. Okay? So, uh, this language of ALC, it only uses, well, pretty much what you should be used to if you had any exposure to logic. Boolean operators like negation, conjunction, and disjunction. Uh, two quantifiers exist on for all. And then, of course, you have your uh, concept names as well. So the syntax is, we have those um, uh, connected. And then, oops. And then we form ALC constants. So the way how you form is that you say that, well, this is what typically you find in logical literature. You find a definition of a concept based on already defined one, so like recursive definition. So you say that all concept names, top and bottom, are concepts. Then if you have already a concept, and you add the negation sign in front of it, you get a concept. And then you have two concepts, C and D, then, uh, well, let me use the logical terms rather than uh, semantic verb terms, the conjunction and disjunction, the existential and universal restrictions, give the new concept. Okay, again, let's have a look at the examples. We've already seen them. A person who has, uh, who only has many children, someone who is interested in computer science and not in philosophy, a living being which is not a human being, etc. Okay, so this is just your reference if you want to come back to the stage. Well. Okay, and a bit more formal, the notion of interpretation, not just drawing on the board, not just, you know, uh, hands and hands. So then an interpretation is a structure which consists of a domain and a reminder that this is an arbitrary set and the dot function and the conditions are that the domain has to be a non-empty set, okay, so you can't have empty domain and the interpretation marks every concept and every uh, row into the concepts are marked into uh, subsets and roles are marked in real relations in your uh, interpretation. So once you've interpreted the uh, concept names, then you can define in a strict way the interpretation of a complex, complex uh, concept expression. <coughs> so the interpretation of top, and that's why it's called thing, is everything. Right? So the interpretation of this symbol is the entire domain, and a reminder that it's not empty. The interpretation of bottom is the empty set. The empty set is a subset of any other set. And then formally, the complement is defined as everything that is not in the interpretation of C. Therefore, is the set difference of your domain and the interpretation of your concept C. And then, uh, as we already discussed, the interpretation, the interpretation of uh, conjunction is uh, the intersection and the interpretation of the disjunction is the union. And I think previously we had a look at uh, examples which I tried to justify this. Uh, now this is the formula giving you the interpretation of a universal restriction. So what it means formally? Okay, how do I interpret? The concept for all R, C, is the set of elements, X, which first, of course, belongs to our domain, okay, so that of the three. And then secondly, for all elements Y from the domain, if the pair X, Y belongs to the interpretation of our relation R, then necessarily Y must belong to C. Okay? So, for example, if there is no such element Y, such that x, y is in, in the interpretation of our relation R, and x belongs to the interpretation of the model RC, as it was shown previously on the, uh, um, on the thingy. And this corresponds to all my daughters are 15 years old, all my giraffes are green, okay? Because there is no giraffe 
with the law which uh, is in the interpretation of uh, the role has. So Morris has no giraffes, therefore I can say that the are a rare property. And the interpretation of the existential restriction exists RC is the set of all elements X from the domain delta such that there exists an element Y. Now we state the existence of an element which is in the R relation with X. Okay, so there must exist an element Y such that the pair XY belongs to the interpretation of our element. And again, you know, it doesn't matter. So you have here this represents uh, a person, this represents male. Now you can have a relationship which is essentially a set of pairs, uh, person, child. Okay, so now we say that if you say, uh, if you want to interpret the concept uh, has child uh, to male, then you've got to have, you've got to have this element which realizes the concept. Okay, now this is what you've seen if you uh, have an export. And I think you know this way rather uh, most people here saw this. We have uh, relationships between uh, constant descriptions. So for example, we have here the law of double negation. So not not C is C. What does it mean? Okay, so if you take any That's the domain, there's the interpretation of the concept C. What is the complement of that? It's the rest. So if C is contained within this circle, then the complement of C is the outside of the circle. So what is the complement of the complement? It's the thing which is not outside the circle. So where is it? It's inside. Therefore, we have that not not C is the same as C. And similarly, we have other laws which you might remember from your mathematics, of course. Uh, so, for example, the universal restriction for all RC is exactly the same as not exists R uh, not C. So, for example, if I want to state that all my giraffes are green, then it's the same thing as to say it is not the case that I have a giraffe which is not green. Uh, the complement of Boolean is usual, so the complement of the uh, and or intersection is the union of all of the complements and vice versa. And then the rest is uh, due to what you've seen so far, so similarly to uh, and for the first left to right, and then the same applies to the or, and finally, you know, let's have a look, for example, on what is the intersection of a concept and its complement. So this is C. The complement of C is the outside of the circle. So what is the intersection? Well, it's nothing. Because if it's inside, then it's not outside. If it's outside, then it's not inside. And we are not considering bounded boundary. In this case, boundary is inside. Uh, on the other hand, the union of a concept and its complement is everything. Why is the case? Well, again, this is C. The outside of the circle is the complement of C. Now, if you take the union, then well, any element will be either here or there. Therefore, every domain element will be contained either in C or in not C, and which explicitly means that the interpretation of C or not C is the Okay, so that was a formal syntax, how we construct constant descriptions. And the semantics we use. And I'm not going to repeat all those implications of having the uh, model theoretic semantics. So why do we want this? We obviously want to reason. And that was exactly why people introduced the constant uh, description language. And when they first introduced that, they didn't have any ontologies, right? So they just had concepts in their mind. And they were linking those forms to one to another, saying which one is more general, which one of them implies that. So the simplest form of reasoning in ALC is the simple subsumption relation. You are given one concept, and you want to know if it's more specific than the different one. 
So what it means means that you want to know if every element in C is contained in D. Examples. I want to be able to compare human beings and living beings. So can I say that every human being is contained in the class of living beings? And the answer is no. Why? Well, very easy. Look at this picture and let's what inside the circle represent human beings and what outside the circle represent living beings. Then, well, it's not the case in this picture that every element from here is there. Well, clearly it's not. I mean, we just look at the inside of the circle and the rest. Therefore, without any extra knowledge, I can't conclude that every human being is a living being. But that's all right. That's exactly what we expect, because I didn't tell you anything about the relationship between humans and living beings. Right? So that's exactly the point of an ontology, but we don't have any extra terminological knowledge yet. We are just comparing the points of descriptions. So, can we really compare something? Well, the first example is really clear. So the first example says that every person who has only has many children is every person who only has many children. So you can notice that this constant description is exactly the same as that one, but it's an example of the fact that we have now formally C and D. So this is my C, this is my D, and every element from here obviously belongs to every element there, uh, regardless of how complex this expression gets, because this is uh, exactly the same expression. But it's not very interesting. And it's not going to get really interesting yet, but still. Let's have a look at another description. Say I have here a person who only has uh, male children, but also I have a person who has a child and all the children are male. Okay? Oh, I've made a mistake, they have to explode. Sorry. So this is C, this is D. Uh, so let me, since I got control of the slide, let me do it here in the point. So what it, the way it has to be is the following. A person and uh, for all has child male and has exists as child. And now I say top. And this is subsumed by a person and for all as a child name. That's it. So why is it the case? But take any interpretation, and that I'm just really trying to explain the role of uh, semantics of description logics in answering the questions. So take any interpretation. I so in the interpretation you have the domain of elements. And we interpret our concepts this way on. So how do I interpret first? Well, oh, it's some last functions. How do I interpret male? Oh. It's obviously some other class of objects, maybe intersecting with this one. Okay, so now how do I interpret the intersection of per people or persons and those who only have male children? Okay, so those who only have many children are those where the R relation is from where they are. So this is P and this is M standing for male. And this is not R, this has child. So we look at all the elements which are linked with this has child relation only with elements which are in M. So this one is only linked with elements from M by this L child relation, but it's not in P. Okay, so it's someone who is not a person but only has many children. Here we have some other element, but it's no children. Here we have some other person who has a male child and some other child. Okay? 
But then my interpretation of for all f sharp male in this case will be well, these elements. So someone who is not person but only has male children, someone who doesn't have any kids, and someone who is a person and does have male child. And not, not, oh, sorry, and not the children, but not this element where we have a male child and some other child. Okay? So now actually the intersection, and the intersection will obviously be this bit. person uh, who has a child or doesn't have a child, but either don't have any children or all the children are males. Okay, so this corresponds to what we have here. Okay, and which one of them then satisfies this? Well. In this example, we only have more than this one because this guy doesn't have any children and our constant description explicitly states that this domain element has to be in the test child relation with something. Therefore, this is wrong. This has to be the other way around. Sorry. Okay? So this is essentially how description logic emerged. They were really looking at ideas you want to formulate, and then you have one formulation of idea and another formulation of idea, and you want to see which idea is more genuine. On the other hand, we already know that this is not true, so we have to have a not here, sorry. And this is another example of what is not true. Uh, so someone who is a person, and on the, uh, if either doesn't have any children or all the children are male, not necessarily is a student for the dream team. Okay, I think you can easily come up with examples of people who have children or male and say no students. And if there are no students, then really they are not contained in a student and something. Okay? So, we already can express some more or less interesting concept descriptions and we can see which one of them is more genuine. A relevant problem is something known as a concept satisfiability and that's related to your, uh, I mean, if you have any experience with protege and sometimes it highlights a class as red one and says, well, actually the class is empty. Well, in logical terms, we say that the class is not satisfiable. Uh, well, we say that that would be around this. So we say that the class is satisfiable if there exists an interpretation in which the extension of this class is not empty. Okay, so uh, simple example. A is a satisfiable concept. Just concept name A is a satisfiable. No? Okay. So here I have a set of three elements, and I say that I interpret A as this one. That's it, it's satisfiable. Okay, so the satisfiable means it can be satisfied. It doesn't have to be true in all interpretations. It can be made true. So if you can come up with an idea of how you satisfy it. So as I said, an example, I make A interpreted as this one. And because it's true in an interpretation in which I have three elements and this one is A. Okay, so this is a satisfiable concept. For all R, B, is it satisfiable or not? Once more. Hmm? Once more. So for all R, B, is it satisfiable or not? Sorry, it is. <laughs> Why? Because say, look at these three, three elements, 
and there are no role relations between them. So then, this is true. Moreover, I can say that let this one and this one be in relation R from here to here. And let this one be in B. Then this is in for all R, B. Why? Because R is interpreted, so let me draw it. So in this case, I'm going to have two elements. This is my R. I may be true here. This is an example interpretation which satisfies this concept for all R, B. Look at this one. It has one node, but one other element which is in the R relation. I have made this B, so this is in for all R, B. Okay? Something slightly more. Okay, well, what about exist R B? Satisfied. Okay. Are there any concepts which are not satisfied? What do you think? How do you make the concept not satisfied? Not exist the Not exist argument. Okay, let's have a look at that one. So, is it satisfiable or not? Hmm? Satisfiable. Why? In the relation. Right, so I mean, a simple example, just one element here with no R relation. How can I make this true? Where is it true? There's one element and it doesn't have any R successor, therefore, this is not true here, but then not RB, not exist RB is true. Okay? So, so, anyone else? A concept which is not satisfied. So it's uh, exists RB and uh, not exist RB. Exists RB and not exists RB. Well, that's it. But in fact, you can simplify it a bit. Make it simply B and not B. It's the same idea. Obviously. Okay, why is it not satisfied? Okay, let's try and satisfy it. Okay, so what does it mean? We've got to take some domain of elements, right? And what does it mean that it is satisfied? There must exist some element here, call it X, such this X is in the interpretation of this. Okay? Right. Now let's have a look whether X is in the interpretation of B. Well, it can be or it cannot be in the interpretation of B. Let's consider cases. Case 1 is when X is in the interpretation of B. But what is then the complement of B? Else. Everything else. So B is here. The complement of B is there. Therefore, it can't be in the intersection of B and not B. Okay? And the other case is symmetric. So if we assume that we now have an interpretation such that X is not in the interpretation of B, well, then it's not there and it's not in the uh, intersection. So regardless of whether our X is or is not in the interpretation of B, we can't ever satisfy this. And this will be, you know, same idea, but you have to draw the others. Mm -hmm. Very simple. Okay. So then if you are... At, okay, well, before I move on, can anyone give me a simpler than that example of a concept which is not satisfied? Not T. 
Monty. It's the second prize, and the winner is the simplest possible. Bottom. Okay? Because bottom, by definition, is interpreted as the empty set. Then we also say that the concept is satisfiable if the existing interpretation in which is interpreted as a non-empty set. By definition, bottom is the empty set, therefore it's not satisfiable. Then you can't get anything simple than this. Okay, good. Yeah. Well, in the second example, we wouldn't have um, two rows. One holds there and points to concept B, and and the second one is called another way. And Sorry, okay. Let's have a look. What you suggest? Let's let. So I have two. two. We could have a concept called B. Okay. So it's interpreted somehow like this, yeah. Yeah. And, and the row called R. Okay. From where to where? From anywhere to B. From somewhere to B. Yeah. And, uh, and the other row called in other way and points to B. So in some yeah. R or um, R second. So the other R. Another R. Okay. Um, wouldn't it satisfy our second statement? This one. Uh, I mean, I give you a simple answer why it's not the case. First, and let me look at this example. It's simply not true because, I mean, in this example, this V is an abbreviation for this complex expression, and this not V is an abbreviation for this complex expression. Therefore, these examples are essentially the same thing. It's just in this case, V is a concept name. In this case, it's a complex expression. But you have a concept, complex expression and not exactly the same complex expression. But that's one of the reasons why, I mean, one doesn't have to look at examples more closely. But still, for our amusement, let's try and look at this. I mean, just to make, make sure that logic is right. Okay? So what I have here is that both these elements belong to the interpretation of the class exists R B. And just to make it clear, the yes. second one arrow should be called in another way, for, for instance. So it has. Okay. So this then does not belong to exist R B. Yeah. Okay? So then this element is in the interpretation of exist R B. But it's not in the interpretation of the complement of exist RB. So when we talk about concept satisfiability, we are never interested to know that there is one element where one part of your concept is true, and some other element where the other part of your concept is true, if you have a conjunction. The conjunction means that it has to be the same element which belongs both to this and that. It means that it has to be a domain element which is both connected with an R row with B and not connected with the R row with B. And you can't have an element which is both connected and not connected. You can have one element which is connected and another which is not. Okay? So you don't really need this uh, S here. But it doesn't matter. I mean, it's good that we stop. I mean, it's better to move slowly than rush through and then Okay? Any questions about concept satisfiability? Right. Why don't you ask me a question? Why do you look at it? <laughs> okay, the reason for looking is twofold. One is, okay, what does it mean that protege reports that a class is unsatisfiable? It means a class is not Yeah, it means assembly. It means it's not possible to have any model in which this class will contain something. Okay? And that, generally speaking, is not good. Because it means that you've modeled your domain, you've modeled your, con you've modeled your concepts, but something in your domain is 
necessarily interpreted as nothing. Right? So, for example, you have a, a, a model of human relationships and it tells you the class of humans is empty. It means that your model only holds where there are no humans around. Which is probably not your intention. So, it's an important problem on its own, but also because it has a close relation to the problem of uh, concepts of assumption. So, uh, I have some. Yeah, somewhere here we have it. So, the concept of assumption is whether every element where, which belongs to the interpretation of C is also contained in every, in, sorry. So every element that belongs to the interpretation of C must be contained in the interpretation of D. So then you have that C is subsumed by D, by definition. Okay? And now I'd say that this is the case even only if this concept is not satisfied. So what is this concept? C and not D. Okay, well, you know, if you look at the picture, it has to be quite clear. Because this is my interpretation of C. Now, it's contained in D. Okay, let's look at the complement of D, which is the outside of D. Now, can I have a point which is contained within C and in the same time, same time is outside of D? I can't have it because C is fully there. Therefore, if C is fully contained in D, then the concept C and not D must be unsatisfied. So I just showed that if you have this, then I must have that. Okay, well, let's have a look at the opposite direction. So let's just you know. If I have this, do I really have it? So what my statement says, Um, so I have somewhere an interpretation of C and I have somewhere an interpretation of D and what I know is that the intersection and C and complement of D must be empty it's unsatisfied but look at this picture clearly it's not the case so assume there exists an element which is in C but not in D Okay, then this element satisfies this. Therefore, if you have unsatisfiability, then necessarily C has to be contained in D. So, you know, that's how logicians prove theorems. They say, okay, well, assume I know that the concept C and not D is unsatisfiable. That is given. So, you now I previously just showed how you go from left to right. Now I'm going to go from right to left. So I assume I know that it is the case that this concept is not satisfiable and at the same time this is not true. <coughs> Therefore I don't go from here to here. So what does it mean that this is not true? It means that there must be an element which is in C but not in D, like depicted in this picture. But then, if that's the case, I can't possibly have the unsatisfiability of this concept because take this element x, it's in C, it's not in D, therefore it's in the complement of D, therefore it's in C and not D. Therefore C and not D is not unsatisfied. If this is the, yeah. Therefore we have a reduction from constant satisfiabilities to uh, Subsumption and the other way around. So why is it worth looking this problem? Because when you come to reason, when it comes to you know checking whether it is truly the case that C is subsumed by D, often it's more convenient to look at the satisfiability of concepts. Okay? Because here it's a uniform problem. You just translate everything away into this, you run your favorite method, and it says it's viable or not. 
and the answer satisfiable or not immediately gives you an answer to whether D is C or not. Okay? Questions? Should be Example. Again, a silly example of a cotton substitute by itself, and then um, we can reduce it to uh, the satisfiability of this and the negation of the right hand side, and then ooh, right. it's equivalent to moving the yeah. it's equivalent to moving the negation inside. But I mean, this is obviously a stupid example. Let's have a look at a different example. Predictions. Is this satisfiable or not? So for all has child male, intersect with exist has child male, not male. You shake your head. And you're right. Because I mean, you know, even before we look at the formal properties, let's just be reasonable. What this says it says it's someone who is bold. Has a child who is not male, and at the same time, all the children must be male. So this shouldn't be the case. Okay, how do we prove it formally? And again, I draw this thing over there. So should we? Assume there is an element X such that it belongs to the interpretation of this concept. So formally what we do is, you know, every time I, I, I write an expression like that, what you should have in mind is something like that. There must exist some interpretation I with some domain, right? And then all my concepts and rows are interpreted some way in this interpretation, but obviously I don't know which way. Because this satisfiability condition says that not than some fixed interpretation, but whether there exists one, like we had this example with A. It's obviously satisfiable in, the, in, a, in an interpretation where I interpret this as A, but I can always consider a different one where there is no A. So I have to find a way to interpret symbols so that it makes my concept satisfied in this interpretation. So I know nothing except for assuming that there exists a domain element, call it X, let's give names because it's easier to refer to elements if we know their names. And we assume that suppose this element belongs to the interpretation of my concept C, and the concept C is for all as child male intersect with this uh, as child not Okay, so from that I can conclude that it's both in the interpretation of for all as child male and in the interpretation of exists as child not male. So what else can I say about this? Well, not much yet. But the second statement is an existential one. So this one can be satisfied in an interpretation where the main element X has no other element Y in the relation to child. Okay? Whereas this one says no, you've got to have some other element, maybe it's X itself, maybe some other element, we don't know where it is, but there must be some element such that it's in the head child relation, and where the arrow goes, you don't have male. Okay? So, there must exist another element Y. I don't know where it is. And remember that the interpretation is absolutely free. We can have exactly, the, no, we can in principle have an arrow like this coming back. But let's say a different element Y. And this is our has child relation. And what we know is that here we don't have male. Okay? But then this is not possible because this statement says that if X is in 
the interpretation of this concept, and some y is in the relation as child, then y must be in the interpretation of main. So we have here that y is both in the interpretation of not main and in the interpretation of main. But this is not possible. Because look, so if this is a class of all elements part of main, then the complement of it is strictly outside, and this is not not male, but not not male, as we already know, is exactly the same thing as male. Okay? And therefore, it is not possible to satisfy this concept. So what do I conclude from here? Well, well, uh, yet something very interesting. But what about this example? Satisfiable. Okay, so you say that there exists a boy, son, and all children are boys. Why not? Can easily come with an interpretation where uh, you have it. So here I have an interpretation in which I have two elements, x and y. Male is y, as child is paired x, y, and then the element x belongs to uh, this interpretation. Okay, and just for the fun of it, I'm going to give you a different interpretation, which is a little bit more mind-blowing, but still, why not? Just to show you that there is no direct link between interpretations and our intuition. So I can have an interpretation with just one element, x, which is in the head child relation with itself. So mathematically, there is no problem. If you look at the human biology, it's impossible. But this is to reiterate the statement that the uh, semantics of description logic offers no help in interpreting symbols as they are intended to be interpreted. Okay? So I can say that I am my own child and I am male. Therefore, I am the witness to this concept that I am my own child and I don't have any other children, so all my children are male. Therefore, I satisfy this concept. Right, I really wanted to give this example to show that many times in, well, whenever people talk about interpretations, well, they're tempted to do it reasonable way, okay? They're tempted to do it like it was shown here. Well, it's reasonable to say that this is x and this is a different y. But if you look at the concept description, there is nothing that says that it has to be a different one. Okay? And therefore, sometimes you run the reasoner and it might come with answers you don't expect. And this is because we don't have this intended meaning imposed on our models. Okay, so now uh, a different example for all R, both COD, and it's just R, COD. C and Five or not? It's, uh, I give you a hint, it's an extension of the previous example. Because it's, uh, I mean, it might be a little too small. Oh. 
Do you want a couple of slides? Hmm? Okay. Yeah. So any ideas, yes or no? Ideas unsatisfied. Yes, unsatisfied. Answers. I guess it's unsatisfied. You guess it's not satisfied. Okay. Any other guesses? <laughs> well, the other guess obviously is satisfiable. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good learning. Yeah, it's, it's either satisfiable or unsatisfiable. Yeah. <laughs> on the board without referring to the you know, slides first. Because I don't think when you do it in real time it's a little bit better. So how should you reason? Yes, I agree. Well, a picture representing my interpretation and assume that I have some element X which is in the interpretation of what is written over there. So the interpretation of the end relation is that it has to be both in for all R not C or D and it exists R, C, and Z. Okay? So this one doesn't force me to do anything yet because this is happy if there are no, no uh, other element Y in the relation R. But this forces me to do something. It says, okay, well, in order to satisfy this here, I've got to have some R successor such that what? What do I have here? Intersection the intersection of C and D. And if I have here, so pull this out of one. If I have now here the intersection of C and D, what do I have there then, automatically? I have both C and D. So I have C here and D here. Right? It's the, the interpretation of both C and D. Right, so, check. This one we have satisfied. What about the other one? In this picture, does X belong to the interpretation of this concept? Yes. Yes. And the reason why is the following. Because since D is true here, I mean this belongs to the interpretation of D, then it belongs also to the interpretation of not C or D. Right? Because to make not C or D true, you don't have to have both C, not C and D. It suffices that you have D. Right? Because, okay, well, regardless of how this is interpreted, if Y belongs to the interpretation of D, it belongs to the interpretation of D or something else. So, my name is Boris Konev, or I'm the Pope. It's a true statement. Okay, the second part is not true. I'm not the Pope, as you know. But I'm Boris Konev. Therefore, regardless of what you add to a true statement as an or, it always became, it remains a, a true statement. Therefore, this element Y belongs to the interpretation of not C or D. Right, and now in this picture, we have element X, which only has one success of Y, and all the successes of X, which is just this one, are in the interpretation of not C or D. Therefore, what I just constructed is an interpretation in which I have an element belonging to the interpretation of this concept. And this is exactly what is shown here. Uh, it also highlights uh, what we're going to look at next. Uh, that here, in principle, in order to satisfy this, you've got to make either C true or D true. You can't make C true, but D is fine. Right. I don't know. We've already done some exercises, so I'm not going to torture you right now with this. But I mean, you can take it with you and think a little bit. And uh, here, well, there are eight concepts, so there are plenty of pairs. And well, you know, maybe just try and see which of those concepts are satisfiable or not. And in what case, 
we have we have one concept subsumed by another. Just you know. So we already have a look at this one. In fact, uh, we haven't looked at we haven't had a look at some others. So for example, okay, well let's just this one, the last one, number six. Is it satisfiable or not? Right? Right here. This is two small fonts. So number six is for all R A. I want to change it. I want, sorry, not number six, number four. And for all R not A. Satisfiable or not? So, okay, your suggestion is like this. But yeah. So then, you are here, and obviously you are in the interpretation of for all R, A. But we are talking about six or Sorry, I, I was wrong. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Number four, I want. I am a bit clumsy. Sorry, you know. If you notice things like you know misspelled words, errors in the wrong direction, etc., please don't hesitate to inform me. So I really want number four. So, hmm? Unsatisfiable. Satisfiable. Why? Because uh, if uh, it has uh, some individual which has no relation. Exactly. So you have an element which is which doesn't have any art successes. Right? So having no children means that you have sons and daughters. So all your it means sorry. If you have no children, then the statement that all your children are daughters and that all your children are not daughters are both true. Okay? So the only reason I really want to highlight this because you know. I wanted this. Not having any uh, art successes, maybe it's true. I mean, it's a little exercise, it's in the slides, we can deal with that later. Right, and now I want to come back to the terminological part of real ontologies. I mean, okay, it was some fun, and obviously different people can model things differently, and you know, the same concept can be described by different concept descriptions, so you can come up with different form of uh, But then, of course, we want to, specify, to, to be able to specify some real relations between concepts in our language. And then we also want to be able to infer some new information based on the original. I told you I'm about it. Right, okay. So let's start gently and look at what is known as a traditional or simple box, where you can only give definitions. Okay, so what do I mean by saying you give definitions? Well, I mean, look at these examples uh, we've seen so far, like... Right, I was saying, a mother hero is a female who has at least three children. Right? Okay, well, I really skipped the connection between this one and this one. Because I was just saying, okay, well, this obviously is a mother hero. Now I want an ontology which will define what I understand by this term. So I can say that this is exactly a female who has at least three children. Okay? Right, so a simple t box or traditional t box is a set of expressions where you define new terms in terms of old terms. So what does it mean? So a new term is a term which does not occur uh, in any... Sorry, it can occur, well, still. <laughs> Important thing is that no name is defined twice. So you can't give a definition of a mother hero, you can't give a definition of a happy father, you can give a definition of I don't know, whatever you come up with. And then we have two kinds of definitions. An exact description, 
like in this example, I have the mother hero is exactly female and has a distribution. So what does it mean? It means that in any, con in any context, if I'm going to see this term, mother hero, then I can conclude that this is someone who is female and has a distribution. And vice versa, if now I have someone who is female and has three children alone, then I know that this person is a mother hero. So here I have an exact definition. But here I probably have an, a primitive or partial definition. So a happy father is contained in the class of males who have not more than three children. But maybe you don't want to call anyone who is male and has not more than three children a happy father. Okay? So means that you only make transition from left to right, but not from right to left. And I require this moment that no name is defined twice. So again, some other examples, less introversion. So I said that the father is exactly a person who is male, and I say this example male not just you know in the intersection of concepts of person and male, but instead I say, okay, well this element cannot be male. Because male is a concept, a different one. But it's in relation as gender with that abstract concept. Which is a different way of forming. And this element must have children. So you have to say that it must have at least one child. And Vice versa, every time you come across any element having these properties, you know that this element must belong to the interpretation of the last one. So, I mean, uh, I, I don't have it on the slide, but remember my dictionary definition. So, I said what a table is. So, every time you come across a piece of furniture which has all the, uh, uh, one or more legs and a flat surface for eating, working, or playing games, you say that this is a table. Okay? Uh, on the other hand, a table is not necessarily a piece of furniture because in geology they also have tables. Not geology, geography, sorry. They have rocks which they call tables. Ge geographical. What's the name of this science? Geological. Yeah, so I was. Some Hmm? Some science about the stones. Okay. In the science about the stones, they have they have a notion of a table which is not for eating, working, or playing games. In medicine, you know, while I can put it on okay, it's working. A student is a person who is registered at the university. Uh, again, you know, I hope you now get the interpretation. It's exactly the same as what we've seen before. So I say that if now I have a concept inclusion like that, then in the interpretation you've already seen it. So um, you now have uh, this is a model of your ontology. If and only if for every concept inclusion C implies D in your uh, ontology, in the interpretation C necessarily. C is contained in the implementation of D. Okay, so what does it mean? So remember, I started with asking you a question. Is the notion of the human subsumed by the notion of a living being? So I have here <coughs> human, I have here living being, and my question was whether or not humans are subsumed by the living being, and the answer was no. And the reason for that could be like that. This is my interpretation. I interpret my humans as this pen, and I interpret my living beings as the other two pens. Pen. And now I have two examples of living beings 
sorry, and I have an example of human who is definitely not a living being. Can I satisfy in a model, uh, in an interpretation, this include a human is a living being? Of course I can. It just requires that my interpretation of living being is includes the interpretation of humans. So essentially, typically we have a relation between an ontology or a key box, as it's also uh, known, and a positive conclusion. And in principle, D may not subsume C, but with the help of O or T, that's the device of the design, whether you use the word ontology or whether you use the word T box, which is most traditional description of uh, terminological box. T box stands for terminological box, so it's somewhere where terminology is described. And now we say, well, you know, th th this makes clearly true if only the interpretation is the same. Right. So, why do you want it? There. Right. Which is the example first. Right, okay. Just let me this. I've lost my plot. Ah, okay. So we whenever ask whenever we ask questions where the one constant description is subsumed by another constant description, without any ontologies as it was presented previously, we only look at what they actually say. Okay, and then we want to make sure that every element which is in the interpretation of this is in the interpretation of that. Well, the intended meaning of our T-box is slightly different. The intended meaning is to say, okay, well, let's now forget about all the interpretations which are bad. So, for example, I might explicitly state that every human being is a living being. And then I am not allowed to consider an interpretation in which this is not the case. And then I can conclude more about the concepts in question if I know extra information about the domain I am modeling. Okay, so this is jumping ahead. Let's have a look at other examples I had here, and then we come to the formal definition and examples uh, again. I just thought, you know, we really want to start some sentence and then restart. Okay, so let's just first have a look at some concept conclusions which can capture some knowledge about our domain. So here I might say that a dog owner is a person who has a pet which is a dog. Okay? Well, it's a sensible definition of a dog owner. Or I can say that a dog owner, a dedicated dog, dog owner, is someone who has a pet which is a dog, and all the pets of this person are on the dogs. Okay? So, a stronger definition. And in this example, I might say that this is not a precise definition, but this might be the true dot uh, Another example, I can define the notion of a first class lounge as a lounge which, is, which has occupants who are first class passengers and only uh, first class passengers. And the question is whether a lounge should have any any passengers at all, or you can be happy with uh, a lounge with, which is not um, occupied by anyone. Uh, some other examples, and this really comes very close to what you've probably seen if you followed, say, the pizza ontology example or any other examples you find online. So you can say that a uh, protein lovers pizza is a pizza which has a only has topics which are meat or seafood. And notice that you know you really need or in your definition because uh, typically meat and seafood uh, will be empty in your ontology. Okay, now let's have a look at why we want those definitions. So we say that a constant is satisfiable with respect to a T-box. In our example so far, we only look at simple T-boxes. 
if there exists an interpretation, I such that on the one hand, all inclusions, including partial or exact definitions, are truly this interpretation, and our concept is interpreted as a non empty set. We say that the concept is subsumed by a different concept. Again, essentially it imposes restrictions on what interpretations we take into account. Okay, so the definition matches the definition of uh, concept inclusion and concept satisfiability, except previously when we didn't have any T box, we were allowed to pick any interpretation, including weird ones. Now we only pick those which satisfy our definitions. Okay? So we'll have a look at examples in the, in, in the moment. And then uh, again, we have uh, a relationship between satisfiability and inclusions. And we say that the tipos is consistent even on the if the existing interpretation which makes it true. Right, okay, so I'll probably come back to those definitions. But first, have a look at an example. So here I have some ontology and some Inclusion. And what the ontology says is that a father is exactly a person who is male and has a child. And a student is a person who is registered at some university. Now the question I'm asking, is it true that the concept student subsumes this concept, a father who is registered at the university? So what do you think? Is it too fast or should I uh, first introduce? I mean, well, let, let's see what you think here. This sort of uh, this concept section, that concept, with the respect to this ontology. How do we do that? Okay, well let's just start from stating that okay, well assume this is true. If that's true, there must be an element X such that. Well, first, we, let's reformulate this as a different statement. Father and exist is registered at union, sorry, registered at university and not student. Okay? The same thing as I was doing before. You have a relationship between concept, uh, between uh, subsumption and concept satisfiability. Any questions about this reformulation? What I've done is essentially I've said, okay, in order to answer to this question, okay, assume this is not so, essentially, assume the and no student is satisfied. And if it's the case, I don't have the inclusion. Because I have someone who is a father, who is registered at the university, but who is not a student. Okay, so I take this of my C. This is my D. What I have over there is C and not D. Okay. Now I assume there is an element X which belongs to the interpretation of this concept. So what does it mean? It means that this X belongs to the interpretation of father. This element does not belong to the interpretation of student. So I ask you somewhere S. And this is in the complement of students, but is in the exists is registered at relation with some element Y, which is in the interpretation of university. I'm just reading what this says 
the rental. Okay. And the principal want to do that and say, oh well, this is a satisfying interpretation. So in principle want to say that now I found an interpretation in which the concept is satisfiable, which means this is not an intuitive. But this interpretation is an arbitrary one. It does not satisfy my ontology. Because I've got to make sure that the ontology falls in here. So if I have someone in the bar relation, then necessarily this has to be in the person relation and how this comes out. Yes, what's this side? Okay, let me start. Uh, Unfortunately, my clumsiness led to the fact that I start putting classes, relations, and this is not good. So let me start again. So what, what I want to show you here is why this is not compatible with our ontology. Okay? So this is an interpretation in which I can make this false. Okay? But this interpretation will not be a good one for my ontology. Why is it the case? Assume that this element x is in the interpretation of my concept far. Then I, it must be in the interpretation of the concept person and has to be linked with the gender relation with uh, male and has to be linked with the has child relation with the well, anything. Okay? But then Here, I have this. That if some domain element x belongs to the interpretation of person, and x does belong to the interpretation of the concept person, and this x belongs to the interpretation of the concept exists, is registered at uni, which again is the case, as we see here, then necessarily this x must be a student. Because this guy works left to right and right to left. So essentially you can look at it this other way. You look at far left and father gives you person. You look at exists registered university, it's here. So a father and exists registered university gives you Therefore, the right. <laughs> but notice that without the ontology, this uh, subsumption does not take place. Because obviously, I can construct an interpretation in which I don't have it, but I can't do it if I have this background knowledge. And that's exactly why we need ontologies. Ontologies provide the background knowledge we can use to derive information about things which wasn't there before. Uh, well, so this was a simple T-box, but sometimes simple T-boxes aren't enough. So everyone of those inclusions give you a disjointness of two concepts. What does it mean, disjointness? It means that the intersection is empty. So here, for example, I want to say that meat, vegetable, and seafood are all different things. So I can't have something which is both meat and vegetable. So what how I do I model it? I say, okay, well, if something is vegetable, then it's not meat. And therefore, I have this group saying this. At the same time, I want to say that if something is vegetable, it's not seafood. But that violates the property of my simple T-box that no concept is defined more than once. Okay, this is my two definitions. 
that vegetable is not meat and vegetable is not seafood. Okay, so clear examples. Sometimes we don't want to have more than one occurrence of a name at the left hand side of the definition. Sometimes, and quite often, you might want to give two definitions uh, with slightly different intended meaning. So typically, when you model your uh, domain, you think about two things simultaneously. One is how concepts relate to each other. So you want to think, say things like that uh, a male person is a person and a person is a living being. You have a hierarchy of objects in your ontology. On the other hand, at the same time, you might want to specify some properties of those objects and then you have two definitions. One positions your concept somewhere in the hierarchy of other concepts and the other one gives the exact properties and then the first one is typically modeled with the uh, inclusion relation or uh, partial definition and the other one is typically an exact definition and finally sometimes you really want something known as a GCI, general concept of inclusion where you have a complex expression in the left hand side of your uh, um, <coughs> of your concept of the inclusion. So this is not a definition. It's a more complex relation between names occurring here. So what I say here is that a disease which has location in the heart is a heart disease. Okay? So in principle I could traverse it and you know uh, make this a definition of heart disease. But I mean uh, you might want to do it this way. Uh, and then, well, uh, the, the reasoning problems are the same as with the CPT box. So some other things you might want to model is range of domain restrictions. So you might want to say that uh, everyone who is enrolled at whatever is a student. Or you might want to say something that can only be enrolled at the university. Now, that's exactly the moment I was fearing that I have some material which I clearly cannot fit within 15 minutes. Uh, but it's there. So, what do you prefer? Should we go very, very quick through some slides? 15 minutes. <laughs> All make it. okay. Well, maybe we have some questions. Wait a bit. Hmm? So, yeah, it's true. Uh, it's true that uh, concept uh, inclusions um, is very clear for reasoning. Yeah, it's not recommended to. Well, it's not anymore, and in principle, in. Okay, well, one of the reasons why reasons work is because we have lots of simple axioms. So if you have one or two G uh, GCI, it's typically not a big deal. If you have 500,000 GCIs, then you're in trouble. Uh, and this is because, well, I, I think uh, Dmitry Tsakov will be talking about this, because of the optimization techniques. The optimization techniques, well, typically when you come across a definition, then um, I don't know what it 